about the subject of money. Uh, there are over 500 verses in the Bible that address finances and property. Of the 38 parables that Jesus tells, 16 of them have to do with money and faithful management of property. Now it's appropriate that we should be talking about that both as Christians, believers, and even citizens. I don't know if you're aware, but um, as a nation, America is in debt. And if you're from another nation, don't look down upon us. You're probably in debt too in your nation. China's got the second greatest national debt, then Japan, then Germany, and it just goes down the line. And the debt that these countries around the world are carrying is staggering. In the United States, for example, uh, back in 2008 when President George W. Bush, and some of you have heard that his father passed away uh, just in the last 24 hours, uh, 94 years old. But uh, George W. Bush, when he went out of office, the national debt of America was ten trillion dollars. Now what you couldn't do with ten trillion dollars, right? But now, just since 2008, in ten years, the national debt is over twenty-one trillion dollars, which means that our national debt is more than our gross domestic product, more than we earn in a year as a country. And so, and it's continuing, it's projected to continue going up. And uh, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. It's like you've got two trains on the same track heading towards each other. There's going to eventually be a collision. It cannot go on like this indefinitely. Eventually there's some kind of implosion. Doesn't know when that is. Every time the government starts talking about having a balanced budget, everybody comes unglued because I have no problem with having a balanced budget as long as you don't take anything away from me. They don't take away my benefits. Take away your benefits, that's okay. So it's become so difficult for the governments of the world to agree to balance the budget. But the reason that the governments are so deeply in debt is because they've learned it from us. America's in debt. There is a debt explosion in the United States. Give you a few little facts here. According to the Federal Reserve's latest numbers, November 18, 2017, the average American household carries $137,000.63 in debt. Yet the U.S. Census Bureau shows that the medium or average household income is just $59,000, which means that many of us are living way beyond our means heard about this couple. They had the house broken into and the thief, among other things, stole the wife's purse with all the credit cards. While the policeman was there filling out the report, the husband took him aside and said, please don't try too hard to find the credit cards. I'm sure that the thief is not spending as much as my wife was. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't nice. <laughs> Total credit card debt in America right now is a 1.2 trillion dollars. No, I'm sorry, that's the auto debt. Debt on auto loans, 1.2 trillion dollars. A 48 billion dollar increase in one year. Uh, the credit card loan debt, 45 billion dollars up. Well, it's gone up 45 billion from 829 billion last year. Total mortgage debt, how much Americans own on homes, 9 trillion dollars up 308 billion from a year ago. And you know the one that's growing the fastest, you know what that is? Student loan. Student loan debt grew to 1.41 trillion dollars up 61 billion from a year ago. I gave one example in this New York Times report of Elisa Paracosa 26 owes $100,000 related to her bachelor's degree in sociology she got from the University of Pittsburgh. The debt shapes every decision in her life right now. Um, she hoped that she could go to law school but she can't continue her education because the debt right now she has is so high. She's living with her mother and working as a graphic designer and, and it could take her years to pay off their debt. I know people that are in their 50s still paying off student debt. And now the debts are much higher than they used to be. So, 
Is it God's plan for us to be in debt? I'd like to talk to you about some biblical principles. You want me to keep going? Is this important? Yes. The Bible has a lot to say about that. So I'd like to share with you just a few biblical principles about debt. Sermon, of course, is how do you find freedom from the bondage of debt? Debt is bondage. There's a story you find in 2 Kings chapter 4. This woman comes to Elisha the prophet. She's got a terrible problem. She said, and her husband was one of the sons of the prophets. He evidently took out a loan on some property, maybe to buy some seed, to farm some land. He was renting. He died before he could pay it back. And in Bible times, if you couldn't pay back your debts, they could start to repossess your property. And they can still do that today. And ultimately, they could take your family members or you and enslave you. So this poor woman, deeply in debt, comes to Elisha and says, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons as his slaves. Because of the debt, her children were going to be enslaved. And debt is a type of bondage. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know what? I'll just tell you why I'm preaching about this. Not that long ago, uh, I was at a church and uh, a lady waited behind until I was done shaking hands and visiting and it was clear to me she wanted to talk to me but wanted to talk to me privately so I stepped aside and visited with her. She broke into tears and she said, uh, I am so deeply in debt, I've got a gambling problem. Nobody knows. I'm a member of this church in good standing. My husband knows. But she says, I'm $500,000 in debt. And I'm afraid that if I die in debt, I'm going to die lost. And will Jesus forgive me? What can I do? So I tried to comfort her that God does not save us based on how much we still owe the credit card companies or whatever it is. Um, but I said, look, you know, you, you, need to, you need to get out of debt and there's things you can do. You need to start working on this. I said, first of all, don't gamble anymore. <laughs> I said, you got to stop. I said, I'd like to tell you, you know, a real special psychological program, but I said, you just got to stop. And she said, but they're having a lottery. I'm serious, she said this. She said, it's a lottery. If I win the lottery, I can pay it all off at once. I said, no. I said, your chances of winning the lottery, I said, you got a better chance of being bitten by a shark on dry ground. I said, don't waste any more money gambling. I said, you got to stop. And it just broke my heart that still she was like, you mean like, I said, yeah, you just, you got to stop gambling. <laughs> you got to stop buying lottery tickets. I said, it's not going to get better. And you'd be surprised how many believers struggle with different kinds of gambling. Some of them, they may not go to the casino. You know, we're, we got an interesting location here at Granite Bay. We're right down the road from the largest casino in California. <laughs> and we thought about putting a sign out in front of Amazing Facts, say, you know, find help. <laughs> but um, it just broke my heart. That poor lady, she was just crying. And she said, you know, the, her relationship with her husband was just in tatters. And he's always putting her down, saying, you know, you've ruined my life because she's stolen from him to gamble. And, and, um, uh, you know what the number one cause is for divorce? <laughs> People think, well, Pastor, you know, we're just going to live together for a little while so we can get to know each other and make sure we're compatible. You ever heard that before? And I heard one pastor say, if you want to find out if you're compatible, you don't need to share a bed because that is seldom the reason that people divorce because the plumbing isn't working. The reason they divorce is because they can't get along financially and try sharing a checkbook for six months and if you want to find out if you're compatible. <laughs> because that's the number one reason that people divorce is financial problems or at least it's there in the mix if it's not the, the number one reason. Uh, the Bible has a lot to say about how we can find freedom from that. And in a moment I'll get back to the story of the widow who came to Elisha. But I just want to explain that debt is a type of bondage. You read Proverbs 22, 7. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is a servant, a slave 
to the lender. You know, it, uh, debt often begins, now, I should probably say, I, I don't want to make everyone feel terrible, and some of you who are doing fine financially right now, um, there's things in the message that are relevant for everybody, whether or not you are in debt. Some people are in debt through no fault of their own. Look at the story of Job. And he was a perfect and an upright man, and he was just slammed through circumstances. You know, the devil did it, or he lost everything. And, but God did a miracle, and you know how the book of Job ends? You might think you're so far in debt that you'll never get out. Job lost everything, and by the end of Job, he is double blessed. So don't forget the God factor if you think your circumstances are hopeless. And I was trying to tell this lady that. She thought, how can I? I said, you can do it. I said, if you'll start following the steps, there's steps you can take and there's steps of obedience. The first step is to repent of your sin, turn, and then you give God permission to work miracles for you. But no one wants to be under a burden of debt. It often starts by people desiring things they should not desire. We try to live today with money we hope to earn tomorrow. There never has been a time in the history of the world where you've had so many things a person can buy so easily. It's incredible now. I'm looking at my computer screen and I just make a couple clicks. The next thing, within five minutes my doorbell rings and there it is. That's an exaggeration. <laughs> but it's incredible to me. You know, I will literally, I'll order something on Amazon Prime and all of a sudden the doorbell rings the next day I go, who could that be? It's there already. And how they got those racquetballs from China to my door in one day, I don't know. It's a miracle. <laughs> but it kind of encourages us, oh, that was so easy. But, you know, I forgot the little part where PayPal charges my credit card. And there's a debt incurred. Now, I, Karen and I, and so I got a witness here today, we do not use our credit cards for credit. Praise God. Once or twice we've forgotten our payment, we've had to pay a penalty, but otherwise we always pay it off. Don't ever use your credit card for credit. It is the very worst form of credit. It is the highest credit, and they are in business to put you in bondage, <laughs> to, well, get you dependent on them. The Bible's pretty clear that we should avoid debt. Romans 13, 8, owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Uh, money is very expensive. If you try to live in advance on money you do not now possess, you're going to struggle. Benjamin Franklin said, if you want to know the value of money, go try and borrow some. Uh, and sometimes if you borrow money from a friend, you need to ask what's more important, the money or the friendship. Because a lot of family relationships and friendships have been permanently damaged because people started to borrow from each other. And it can cause problems. I made the big mistake once of getting involved financially with a church member. And uh, I won't go into the whole story, but uh, one of the church members asked if I would be surety. You know what that means? They got a check from an insurance company and the bank said, you don't have an account here. We can't sign this check, but if someone will co-sign for you and nice family. I said, sure. I co-signed the check. A few days later, I got the shocking news that uh, $1,500 had been deducted from my account. And I went to the bank, stomping, fuming, saying, what in the world? This is you, you, what? And they said, well, you co-signed for the check. The insurance company canceled the check. And since you co-signed, we took it out. Well, then I went and paid a visit to that family, made a pastoral visit. <laughs> and said, uh, we got a little problem here. I said, Houston, we got a problem. And they said, oh, Pastor, we are so sorry. There was a problem. And he was an auto body man. And he said, I, I was working on this car, and they said the work wasn't complete, and they canceled the payment. And I said, We're, I'll pay it off. And he comforted me. I said, okay, you know, we, didn't, we are all right for a little while, but um, that was our vacation money. Uh, when I first met this family, they were sitting right up front in the church, singing, very engaged, very involved, teaching a class. A few weeks went by and they were struggling in their business and no payment was forthcoming. And I noticed they started moving back in the pews. 
because it's really hard to sit there and listen to your pastor preach to you about repentance or something, you know, and you think everything he says, he's talking to you because you owe him money. I mean, instead of seeing me as a pastor, he saw me as a creditor. And so it started to ruin the relationship. And the short version of the story is God asked me to do unto others is I saw the family every week there moving further and back, and then they started missing church. I'd go visit him just to visit him. First thing that came to his mind was the debt. All he knew about our relationship was I owe him. And they were so embarrassed. Good people. And that debt wrecked our relationship. By the way, if you feel like you're in debt to God, it affects your relationship. That's why the Lord freely forgives you. And I finally, after wrestling with the Lord, I prayed, and it wasn't easy. I went to see this brother one day and said, Brother, I said, just forget the debt. At first he didn't believe I meant it. I didn't believe I meant it at first either. <laughs> And, uh, but I finally convinced him and myself. And you know what? They came back to church and made their way back up to the front row. And we're still friends today. But uh, the whole relationship was being jeopardized. You got to really, if you go into business with a friend, you better ask what's more important, friendship or the business? Because sometimes they interfere. Proverbs 6, verse 1. My son, if you have put security if you have put up security for your neighbor and you've given a pledge for a stranger, if you are, you are snared by the words of your mouth, caught in the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, save yourself, for you have come into the hands of your neighbor. Go, hasten, plead urgently with your neighbor. Give your eyes no sleep and your eyelids no slumber. Save yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. Hunter's trying to kill the gazelle. The fowler's trying to kill the bird. It says, run for your life. Save yourself. Get out of debt. This should be the attitude that Christians have when we start going into debt and taking loans because otherwise it could be slavery. You know how we get enslaved? Jesus said he's gone to prepare a mansion for us. We can't wait for that mansion there, so we want our mansion here. You know, the, the living standard of the poor in America is much higher than most places in the world. I see people all the time that are getting government assistance and they've got an $800 smartphone and they're driving a car. Uh, we just figured, well, these are necessities. The fact is that we are spoiled. Is it okay for me to say that? We are spoiled and we are trying to live way outside of our means. A lot of people, young people, they get out of college, they want to have the same kind of house and car their parents have, but they don't remember that mom and dad worked 40 years before they could afford a house and a car like that. And we want instant gratification. We want to click and get it. We want fast food. We want drive through wealth. And uh, that's what's happening. Is because we want everything right now, people are getting themselves in bondage with debt because we're living outside of our means. In order to have prosperity in the future, you need to experience self-denial. Now, I'm not speaking to you as one who is saying, I'm up here and, uh, you know, I, I've always known these things. I've had to borrow money. Not all borrowing is bad. There's times you may need to borrow. You've got, there's percentages. You've got to know what your income is. It's got to be manageable, but you may need to borrow for a home. I was first went into the wood business. I remember I went to Wells Fargo Bank. I was just trying to borrow $350 for a chainsaw. Saw died. I had no money. I needed the saw to get more money to get the wood. I had sales. I went to the bank and I found out the hard way. It's hard to borrow money if you don't have credit. I said, well, how do I get credit? They said, well, you got to borrow money. <laughs> I said, help me understand this. <laughs> I said, I am I would love to help you give me credit right now. I said, here's your opportunity. Lend me some money. They would not lend me money. Finally, the pastor lent me the money to get the chainsaw, and I paid him back. <laughs> but it's no fun. I hate owing. I hate owing money. I, I just, to me, uh, you know, it, it just, yeah, I can't get it off my mind. And so I like to pay everything right away. We've had to borrow on our house. We had a mortgage, praise God, paid off. Karen and I just moved into a house over here. People with amazing facts know I had to borrow from my retirement. It's paid off now. I had to borrow a manageable amount. So I know how it feels. I hate to admit this to my church family. 
I have had to get government assistance many years ago, like 40 years ago, for medical help, for food stamps. It's humiliating. I didn't want to ever do that again. This is when I was a baby Christian. I started following the Bible principles, and praise God, we don't have debt now. And we're trying to live within our means. The idea for a Christian is you want to work hard, save as much as you can, so you can give as much as you can. And there's a lot of people who could be reached with the message of the gospel, but they're not sending enough missionaries and pastors. How will they hear unless they're sent? That's what the Bible says. Because the funds of God's people are often bound up by the devil in debt, buying things they didn't need. And so the devil has actually hijacked a lot of souls who would otherwise hear the gospel because the people of God are trying to, it's covetousness is what it is. Trying to own things that they don't really need. I'll tell you a little secret. Um, Karen and I came back from Canada. The folks were so nice to us up there. We had a wonderful meeting. They gave us some gifts. When they gave a little gift card to myself, Pastor Ross. They gave me a gift card to Cabela's, which is great for me. You know, I never think it's fair when a man and woman get married and you register at like Macy's. What's a man going to get at Macy's? <laughs> you know, that's just not right. Go Home Depot maybe. But anyway, so I've, I was so excited Cabela's and Bass Pro Shop have merged. So I went to Bass Pro Shop yesterday, for, you know, up here in Rockland. I showed them my card. I said, is this card good here? Yep, it's good here. Go crazy. Have fun. <laughs> and I'm walking up and down the aisles. I'm going, oh, look at that hunting light. 1,400 lumens. That'd be a lot of fun. And they're going, that sleeping bag, it's good to 40 below zero. Of course, I didn't know when I'd ever use that. <laughs> and so I'm looking at all these things. And I just walked around. I just said, wow, I could buy anything here that fits on my card. And I walked around, I walked around, and then I started going, how often am I going to use that? How often, do I really need that? And you know, I finally kind of came under conviction. I said, you know, Doug, you're going to have to preach about debt tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so I walked out, I still got my card. I haven't spent it yet. <laughs> because I started saying, do you really, how often are you going to use that? <laughs> and then I started thinking, do you need to buy everything for yourself? Oh, there's a thought. Maybe if you get a windfall, you don't keep it all. You know how often you, someone gets a raise? They get a tax refund they weren't expecting. First thing that comes to their mind is, now what shall I buy? <laughs> it's me, me, me. Sometimes God blesses us as a test to see if we'll pass on the blessing. We're naturally selfish creatures, and I'm telling you this from personal experience. I'm one of them. You know, you can read in the book Christian Stewardship, a great quote, page 272, shun the incurring of debt as you would shun leprosy. And again, pamphlet 107, owe no man anything and you'll have s not have so much perplexity. Live within your means. Shun debts as you would a great evil. Now the author goes on to say there are appropriate times to take out manageable debt to build something, you know, we, little story, you know, we're showing you the building program up here. All that you see, the building progress so far on that building, we have not used the bank money yet. Did you know that? <laughs> Praise God, we're not wanting to. We have an approved loan, so we don't want to start building and not finish. You know what Jesus said about that? Count the cost. We want to make sure we've got the funds approved to finish. We do. But we're hoping everyone follows through with their capital campaign pledges because that bank money is really expensive. Did you know that? The interest on that, we're hoping by God's grace we can glorify Him and say we never use the bank money because God's people rose to the occasion. And so, I, but sometimes you need to borrow money to buy a car. You don't have to buy the brand new car. Do you know when you buy a brand new car that after you drive it off the lot you've lost about 20% of the value of that car just as you pulled off their parking lot. I got a quad up in Coal. I like riding quads. You know, up in our ranch, we have quads. They're practical up there. We, we use them for work. It's, it's a very important thing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I bought one about nine, ten years ago. Still running. 
four-wheel drive, 700, Yamaha, big, beefy tires, winch, heated hand grips, gun racks, cargo storage. It had tricked out with uh, aluminum, had everything on it. But I bought it used on Craigslist from someone who bought it new and they lost 60% of the value of it in one year. Now I felt sorry for them because here they, they bought all this and then the economy changed and they hadn't been thinking ahead. They had to make payments on this thing and they, they bought this big toy and you know, I'm very thankful now because it's still running, still got the tires on it and, you know, and I use it all the time but boy, I can't imagine buying that new. And a lot of people if you, if you need a car, a lot of people go buy new ones, wait a little bit, and you save a lot of value. If you're going to buy a new car, you better drive that thing for 100,000 miles before you get your value out of it. Now, I've bought new cars before, but I drive it like 11 years. And you just want to make sure you get your value out of it. So sometimes you might need to do that, but we need to avoid debt. Reckless financial irresponsibility is a sin. We will all give an account to God for every idle word we speak. Have you ever considered we may be giving an account to God for the idle money we spend? God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. A Christian, I don't want to sound legalistic because God is merciful, but a Christian needs to think, I want to be faithful. Jesus said, these are His words, Luke 16, 10, He that is faithful in that which is the least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in that which is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you the true riches? And if you are not faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Christ here is talking about faithfulness in stewardship. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Uh, some of us are, we pinch pennies and we waste dollars. You heard of that about it? that expression before, what is it? Penny wise, dollar foolish. And um, if you take care of the pennies, the dollars usually take care of themselves. You need to be wise in how you spend. Now Karen and I go back and forth. She buys her gas at Costco because it's cheaper. I buy mine at Arco because it's faster. <laughs> and she's right, she is saving money. But I don't like waiting in line. I, my time is worth something. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you what, <laughs> it's not five minutes. It's also the other one's closer and more convenient and there's something for that. And you know, we argue, we talk about this, we have this conversation frequently. Did I talk to you about marriage and money? I did mention that, didn't I? <laughs> and um, I said, dear, that difference for what I'm going to buy, you're talking about a dollar fifty difference. I said, for a dollar fifty, I will get in and get out of there. And uh, so, now, wouldn't it be great if that was the biggest kind of problems we had in our marriages with money? <laughs> we don't mind sharing that with you. But uh, I know some of you, there are very serious problems. Uh, isn't it interesting how God attracts opposites? You'll get one that's kind of a free spender with one who's really frugal and they fall in love somehow. And one is saying, hey, look at that, let's get two of them. You know, and the other one saying, no, we got to save, we got to save. You know, and it, it's just, the, you know, it's sort of a big cosmic joke how God does that to us. You know, it's true, but it, covetousness is a sin. And the reason a lot of people are in debt is because they see it, I want it, I buy it. Some people have spending problems. I know folks who are always looking at the shopping channels. Got, I can't um, understand it now. I just, I surf by and I see they got these channels and 24 hours a day they're saying, buy this, buy this, it's all wonderful. And there are people that watch those channels. There must be because they're on all the time. And they're always going, yeah. Uh, they make you think that you can't live without whatever this gizmo is that they've got and people buy this stuff. They put it in the garage, they never open it. I know people that have their garages full of stuff that they have bought online or they bought on sale. They didn't need it but it was on sale. And it looked good and it's impulsive buying. And they've wasted thousands, some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars for stuff they didn't even need. Got real quiet suddenly. 
Now, if we do buy something, if you buy it on time, if you have a debt, Christians should pay their debts. You may not like the credit card company, but very rarely does the credit card company torture you into buying things. You usually have to make a choice somewhere along the way to do it. And you can read the fine print and find out what the interest rate is. And if you have incurred a debt, I was driving down the road with Karen, we heard a commercial on the radio, kept repeating, don't let those mean credit card companies fool you into thinking you've got to pay them back. <laughs> you don't have to pay them back. Well, you know, there are things you can do if you're deeply in debt to a credit card company, you can find some legitimate counseling to help negotiate the interest. But the idea that someone else should pay for the gizmo in your garage is not a Christian principle. If you buy something, you should pay for it. Oh, but Pastor Doug, my debt is so big, I owe, like that lady I mentioned, half a million dollars. I'll be dead before I can pay it. Well, you know what? Even if you were to say, I am by God's grace going to pay $10 a week, I'm going to make some changes in my life, and I'm going to pay $10 a week, you'd be surprised. God will bless you. Start doing something. But to throw your hands in the air and say, I know it's my debt, but I can't pay it all, so I'm not going to pay any of it. A Christian ought to make an effort to pay their debts. Isn't that right? It doesn't mean that you starve your children in order to pay it back. You know, you have to have your priorities, but don't neglect your debts. And the Bible says, Psalm 37, I think we have that on the screen, the wicked borrows and does not repay. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 5.5, 5, better not to vow than to vow and to not pay. You got that verse in Psalm, I think it's 15, where it says, if you swear to your own hurt, a Christian swears to their own hurt and changeth not. You've made a decision. It was a bad business decision, but you've made a promise. You don't change your word. Jephthah made a really foolish vow. He said, whatever comes through my gates, if you give me victory, I will offer to you, Lord, whatever comes through my gates. His daughter came through the gates. And he shrugged and said, oh, Lord, you know, I was just kidding. Or did he keep his word? His daughter was dedicated to the temple. She served in the temple the remainder of her life. She never married. And um, he made a vow and he did not change. Christians need to keep their promises. Now, I, I want to pause. Some of you got an insert when you came in. If you got a bulletin, did any of you get one of these? I'm not going to go through all of it because uh, I, I just want to cover the main principles here. But I thought, you know, this is such an important message. I don't want to carry this on for three weeks. I want to put in your hands some simple principles. These are not all original with me. I sort of did a little cut and paste on the internet. Some of it's from Dave Ramsey. He's got some Christian counseling, good programs, and Larry Burkett and others. But I tried to simplify. This is the Dugified version of uh, seven sure steps for deliverance from debt. Open a savings account. You might be thinking, Pastor Doug, I have no money. You know, you can open an account now with $10. Start by opening a savings account. Open it in another bank than where you keep your other accounts so you're not tempted. That bank is only for putting money in. As soon as you begin to start putting money away, something happens to your psyche and you start realizing, I am now building instead of constantly diminishing. And um, you can read the information in there. Create a budget. Now, if you get point one and two mixed up, that's okay. But most people are in debt because of a very simple principle. Their outgo is more than their income. Some people have no idea what their income is and they have no idea what their outgo is. And if you ask them to make a list of how much do you spend a week, they just kind of give you a rough round figures. And I say, well, is that including your lunches every day for $15? Is that including, you know, these little, stopping at the store and buying whatever the trinkets are or, or people going through the drive through and getting $5 coffees and all this stuff? And they say, oh, well, yeah, I didn't realize how that added up. So start getting a budget. Sit down. Look at your receipts. You can figure out where it's going and be honest about that. Create a budget. Get a strategy to live within that budget. If you have debt, allocate how much you can pay on those debts. Rethink your grocery basket. Uh, some people walk down the aisle with their basket and they just grab things and throw them in. I've seen kids going along down the aisle with their parents. They're just grabbing the Fruit Loops off the 
They're still throwing them in the cart or whatever it is, and the parents go, they just shrug. They just, some of that stuff's expensive. <laughs> There's things you can do that are healthier and more economical. You can buy things that you can like cook and they'll last a few days. You know how cheap rice is? Do you know how many ways you can prepare rice? I remember once all I had was rice. I was so poor, the only thing I had was rice. And I did have raisins, so I had rice with raisins for breakfast, put a little sugar in it. I had like fried rice for lunch, <laughs> steamed rice for dinner. I mean, I, this is an exaggeration, but that would be the bare basics. Um, so, so some people might think about how you're shopping with your cart. Be faithful in your tithes and offerings. Oh, pastor, that's going to blow my budget. No, you haven't read the Bible. Bible says that if you want your money to go farther, be faithful to give God what is His. If you want God to bless the remaining 90%, be faithful with at least that 10%. But if you're faithful in tithes and offerings, God says, I will open for you the windows of heaven. And God will start doing things for you that don't make sense mathematically in blessing you. And Bible, that's why we read that uh, opening verse in our scripture. And then you can read some of these other steps. Purge the house. There's a lot of mysterious items we've got in our houses, in our attics. Some things aren't even open. Things that others might want we're not using. You can actually sell. Now with eBay, they didn't have that 50 years ago. It's getting easy. Snap a picture. Put it online. There's junk you got you don't think anyone w would want. You'd be surprised. Some of you have treasures in your house you may not even know about. Things you have no idea what it's worth. Cut what you can live without. So you might have memberships you're not using and magazines you're not reading and you'd be surprised. You can start win winnowing things down. And then learn new ways to earn which is a transition into my other point here. Um, there's things you can do to earn more money. Work. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's a commandment I read somewhere. It says six days you should labor. Not only does it say you should rest the seventh and bless your heart for doing that, but you should all work. Now, if you're retired or if you're physically unable, but there's a lot of people who there's stuff you can do even from home with a computer now and earn the income. I know a lot of people that make incredible money at home typing, doing something on the internet or with a computer. Proverbs 13.4, the soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent will be made rich. Proverbs 13.11, wealth is gained, wealth gained by dishonesty will diminish. That's like gambling. But he who gathers by labor will increase. The good old fashioned hard work. Uh, watch out for get rich quick schemes. Uh, they often turn into disasters. And you know, multi-level marketing schemes are probably a couple legitimate ones out there, but uh, most of them um, I think you should avoid. Proverbs 28, 20, a faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Work is good. I want to read something from the devotional called Our High Calling, page 222. However humble the occupation may be, if only honorable, if the humble duties are done faithfully, he will not lose his reward. Industry is essential to health if habits of industry were encouraged, a door would be closed against a thousand temptations. Those who lounge away their days having no aim or object in life are troubled with dejection and tempted to seek amusements and forbidden indulgences which enervate the system and tax the physical powers tenfold more than the most taxing labor. Doing nothing is worse for your health than working hard. That's the short version of that. Many die because they have not the ability or the inclination to set themselves to work. Nothing to do has killed thousands. God designed us with a purpose. You know, I heard a pastor say one time, if you make yourself useful and keep busy, God is more inclined to keep you around. He created man, put him in a garden to work. And then even after sin, God said, well, you've sinned, so I'm going to let you off. He, he gave him more work to keep him out of trouble. <laughs> right? And so it's so important that we find a way to be busy and everybody's got gifts. Everybody can do something. So work. Six days of labor. Ephesians 4.28 
Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, what is good, that he might have something to give him who is in need. I've done all kinds of different jobs. I've shoveled dirt for work. I've picked oranges for money. I've cut firewood. I've done mechanic work. I've built houses. I mean, I know what it is to work. And you know, I kind of miss working with my hands. You know, that's Karen. We just went up to the ranch a couple of days ago. And we spent two days vacation working. And it was so much fun for me. Working in the shop, and burning brush, and we're cutting wood, and, and, uh, and I've actually found it a relief. I've often told uh, Pastor Ross and Pastor Quetzalvite and Brumman, they said, I don't mind pastoring if you just didn't have to work with people. <laughs> I really like working on things. <laughs> I'm kidding. Don't take that too personal. I'm just trying to be funny. Too late, too late now. <laughs> Obey and God will bless you. Now after you do everything practical you can do to get out of debt. Some of these principles we've given you, you might say, Pastor, I still don't see how I can make all ends meet after I do all these things. It still seems like the outgo is going to be above the income. You start obeying. Draw near to God, He'll draw near to you. You be faithful in the little things and God will then begin to bless. You will give God permission to work miracles. What happened to that woman? She came to Elijah with an insurmountable debt. My, my sons are going to be taken as slaves. And you know what Elisha said? What do you have? Well, they, they've taken everything. All we have left is a little jar of oil on the mantle. He said, okay, you consecrate what you've got left to God and watch what happens. She filled her house with borrowed vessels, filled them with the oil. God worked a miracle. She sold the oil. It paid the debt and left a surplus where she and her sons could live off the surplus. God worked a miracle for her when she brought her burden to Elisha. When we bring our financial burdens to Jesus and we say, Lord, I'm determined to obey you. I don't have much, but I'm going to consecrate myself and all I have to you. When we do that, we then give God permission to activate heavenly agencies and providence that can help turn things around for us that we can't think of right now. So God invented math. And you may not be able to calculate how God's going to get you out of debt, but if you begin to be faithful in not trying to live outside your means, in not spending recklessly, certainly not gambling, working hard, saving, uh, being faithful in your giving, you will give God permission to activate miracles in your behalf and take care of you. He's got a thousand ways to answer our prayers when we can't see any. Deuteronomy 18.8 uh, 818. And you'll remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. Who gives you power? A financial plan? It's the Lord who can do it. Luke 638. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will men put into your bosom if we're faithful. God says, I can open for you the windows of heaven. Deuteronomy 15, 6, For the Lord your God will bless you just as He promised you. You will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow. You will reign over many nations, but they will not reign over you. It's because the, you don't want to be the slave to the lender. Now, in conclusion, when we talk about how to find freedom from debt, I've kept everything so far in the context of money, but that's really not what the message is about. Because we've got a debt that is deadly. There are solutions to the money problems. Sometimes we think that's the biggest problem in our life. The money problem is not the big problem in your life. God can take care of those problems. I remember reading the story of Mark Twain. He made a fabulous amount of money as a successful writer, became very wealthy. Then he tried to go into the publishing business. He invested in this crazy typesetting machine. It was a machine. They used to set all the type for books by hand. And some guy said, I've invented a typesetting machine. You hit these keys and it'll set the type for the next print. And Twain thought, that's the greatest idea in the world. He invested in this and they could never perfect it. And they, he spent thousands and thousands. They bar finally borrowed money and no finally they finished the machine and nobody would buy it at that point. He lost his entire fortune and he was deeply in debt. But he believed he should pay his debts. They were his debts. So he went on tour and he started working hard. And he went on a tour around the world sharing his books, 
doing public speaking. It was extremely successful, came back home, paid off all his debts, and died a wealthy man. So I can tell you stories. You've heard of Barnum and Bailey Circles, P.T. Barnum. That guy was a very creative guy. He, his parents were actually uh, Quakers, and he, he had some religious scruples, believe it or not, but he completely, he made fortunes, and then a fire came and burnt down everything. He lost everything. But he had principles of honesty in his business, and he made it all back. Then another fire. He lost everything. And then he kept working again. He wouldn't give up, and he made it all back. He ended up dying a wealthy man. So you think that you get taken down to nothing. How will you ever recover? Where's your faith? Uh, God can turn things around. Look what he did for Job. You've got to believe all things are possible with God. So obey him. Now we owe a debt for sin. Sin is a debt. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. That's a pretty heavy debt. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. Jesus is paying our debt. Matthew 6.12 when we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Father, forgive us our debts. What does God call sin? A debt. You can also read that in Luke 14. Forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who is indebted to us. We got this incredible debt to sin. How big is it? There's a parable in Matthew 18 where a king, who's the Lord, has a servant who owes him 10,000 talents. He said, okay, you got to pay me or we're going to sell your wife and your children as slaves. And he falls down, he says, have mercy. King says, okay, I'm going to have you mercy. I'm going to forgive the entire debt, 10,000 talents. I mean, it's the largest number you find in the Bible as far as an amount. 10,000 talents, big debt. And he's freely forgiven. That represents our debt to God. And God is willing to forgive us that debt because Jesus paid for it. You ever tried to add up all your sins? How much would that cost? If you had to pay 50 cents per sin, you'd all be bankrupt. <laughs> right? Now Jesus paid our debt. Colossians 2.13 And you who were dead in your trespasses, penalty for sin is death, dead in your trespasses, God is made alive together with Him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He set it aside, nailing it to the cross. He canceled it. Jesus, by His death, if we by faith embrace His mercy, He said, I have paid for all of your sins, all of the sins of everybody who's ever lived. He died for the sins of the world. Isn't that what it says? And some Calvinists believe He only died for the sins who would believe. I don't believe that. I believe he died for the sins of everybody, which makes the wicked even more culpable because he paid for their sins and they still would not accept him. So Jesus paid our debt. 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that having died to sin, we might live for righteousness. With his stripes you're healed. Have you ever had someone pay your debt? Ever, you ever been surprised by someone who paid a debt? I remember I was coming back from a meeting at the conference office one day and I went to the toll booth, it was like five dollars and, and I got to the toll booth and the guy said, uh, you're good to go. I said, well, no, here's, he said, I couldn't understand it, it just left me confused. It, he said, no, that guy paid. So I don't know who, if they saw me in the rear view mirror, I don't know if they knew me, I don't know if they just felt happy that day and said, hey, here, this is for me and the guy behind me. Or I don't know if I cut between him and his other family member. <laughs> And it wasn't meant for me. I was always wondering, was that meant for me? <laughs> or did I steal someone else? Where Karen and I were eating out with some friends at a nice restaurant. And while we were there, we, we saw another family we recognized. And, and when it came time to leave, uh, I asked for the bill. And uh, they said, no, it's covered. I said, what? I said, no, it's paid. Now, this was, this was a, 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 an Asian restaurant. And quite honestly, the, the guy had a heavy accent. And so I thought I didn't understand him. I said, what? He said, no, no paid, no paid, it's that paid. I said, what? He said, no, this other guy, he paid you. He says, okay. And finally, it made it clear that this other family that we saw, that we said hi to, they told him, put their re dinner on our meal. And then they left before we could thank them. 
Now that was, that was more than a toll. That was a nice dinner in a nice restaurant. Had like six of us there. And someone, you ever had that happen to you? It's kind of a fun surprise, yeah. Someone just, I'm going to pay. What makes, what makes us appreciate a debt cancel? You know what makes the difference? I was really happy when someone paid my $5 toll. Uh, I'm really happy if someone pays a $50 dinner. But when someone pays my death debt, and they say, I will die in your place. So what makes the difference in how much you appreciate is the size of the debt. Doesn't that affect your appreciation? How big is the payment for the debt? You know, one time Judas was mocking Mary because he said, you're wasting that precious oil on Jesus' feet. And Simon was thinking, if this man was a prophet, he'd know who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus knew what Simon and Judas were thinking. He says to Simon, I've got a question for you. Jose on, Master, he said, uh, two men were in debt. One owed 50 pence, the other owed 500. And the king forgave them both. Which of them do you think will love the most? And Simon said, well, I suppose the one who is forgiven the most, he will love the most. And Jesus said, you know, Simon, I came to your house. You didn't kiss me. This woman has not stopped kissing my feet. He said, you didn't wash my feet. She's washed my feet with her tears. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loves much. For to whom much is forgiven, the same loves much. To whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. How much you love the Lord is going to be in direct proportion to how much you know that he has paid for your sins. If you understand the staggering amount that he paid for your sins, not just dying, suffering and dying for all the sins you've ever committed, will you want to go out and spend more on sin to put on Jesus' tab? After he's paid so much for your forgiveness, do you want to crucify him afresh by continuing a life of sin? None of us wants to get deeper in financial debt, but why would you want to get deeper in sin debt? You know, there's a beautiful quote that I will close with. It's from the book Desire of Ages, and I apologize, I forgot to put down the reference. The spotless Son of God hung upon the cross, his flesh lacerated with stripes, those hands so often reached out in blessing, nailed to the wooden bars. Those feet so tireless on their ministries of love spiked to the tree. That royal head pierced by the crown of thorns. Those quivering lips shaped to the cry of woe. And all that he endured, the blood drops that flowed from his head, his hands, his feet, the agony that racked his frame, the unutterable anguish that filled his soul, at the hiding of his father's face, it speaks to every child of humanity, declaring, it is for thee that the Son of God consents to bear this burden of guilt. For thee he spoils the domain of death, and he opens the gates of paradise. He who stilled the angry waves and walked the foam-capped billows, he who made devils tremble and disease flee, who opened blind eyes and called forth the dead to life, he offers himself upon the cross as a sacrifice, and this from love to thee. You think about the cross. Think about what Jesus did for you and how much he suffered because he loved you. And he's offering to get you out of debt. He's offering you a way to be free from the debt of sin. Why would you not want to accept that? It'd be an insult to say, oh Lord, I'll pay you back. You can't pay for it. You can't afford it. He's offering it. The, what shall I do? What shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits for me? You know what David says? I will take the cup of salvation. You just take it and you thank Him for it. And then you walk in a newness of life out of gratitude for Him. Is that your desire? You know, that's the, uh, that's the good news. That's the story of like the book of Ruth. It's all about redemption. There was a debt that could not be paid and Boaz is the redeemer. Jesus is our redeemer. And we're going to sing about that. It's uh, the song Redeemed. Now, I know there's two versions of it. I think it's 3-3-7. Is that correct? So let's stand together as we sing. <laughs>